Okay, Stefan, the recording has started, so go ahead and take it away. All right, sounds good. Good morning, good afternoon, everywhere, uh, wherever you happen to be in the world right now. My name is Stefan Kutchishaw, as uh, Len just said. I'm a Senior Director for Solution Product Marketing at CA Technologies, uh, focusing on, on storage. And I'll also be the moderator for uh, today's webcast. Today we're going to focus on a new uh, storage software enhancement for uh, storage tape operations that are just uh, now available in the new release, uh, version 14 of CA tape, uh, CA1 tape management. Uh, we've got a great speaker lined up for you today. Our webcast is scheduled for just about an hour, including Q&A. Uh, a couple of logistics here. Uh, a copy of the presentation will be sent to you after today's webcast is completed. Um, if I could ask you to place your phones on mute if you haven't done so already. Um, uh, that way we can improve the quality of the webcast, eliminate any, any background noise. And also, if you'd like to ask questions, please, we want to be able to hear from you uh, on today's topic. So feel free to submit a question to our presenter throughout the, uh, through the screen that's at the top. You'll notice there's a chat button. So at any time during the presentation today, use the chat capability. Uh, we'll then uh, take your uh, questions at the end of today's session. Uh, logistics aside, let me um, uh, welcome today's presenter. Most of you know him. He's Russ Witt. He's the senior principal architect, I believe it is, uh, here at CA Technologies. Chances are, if you've ever needed a question that needed to be asked about CA1, you've likely talked with Russ. Everybody knows Russ. Uh, he's a recognized thought leader in storage management with a special focus on tape management. Passionate technologist, he oversees the storage management software development and support at, uh, here at CA. Uh, and also, if you're involved at SHARE, you probably know him. He's a project leader there as well as a featured speaker. So enough of the intros, logistics. Uh, keep those questions coming throughout. Russ, we're ready for you. We're thrilled that you're here today and looking forward to hearing uh, what's new in CA1. Russ, go ahead. All right, thank you, Stefan. Got to clean my boots off after all of that, though, I'm so thick. <laughs> all right, so let's begin. Hopefully everybody will see. I'm starting out on slide two, CA1 version 14. One of the things we did initially was a further reduction in our CSA below the line by moving some more modules to eCSA. So we um, further reduced our usage by another 40%. It does, however, have a requirement that if you have user-written code, either exits or a standalone module, that uses our TMM date macro, it needs to be reassembled with the 14.0 macro. Uh, the 14.0 macro is downward compatible, so if you reassemble it with the 14.0 macro, it will work fine on the 12.6 system, but it is uh, required that you reassemble any standalone modules or exits that use the TMM date macro. And again, any reduction, of course, of CSA below the line is a good thing because it allows your application programs to have a larger private area below the line. Hey, Russ, this is Stefan. Um, Len's going to take control here in a second. Um, we're having a little bit of a technical issue with the screens. We're seeing two screens on one. We're going to try and make it larger. Uh, there it goes. So um, he's going to give you um, control again, and you should be able to go ahead. There we go. Nice full screen there. You should be able to um, advance the screens now, just like if it was on your desktop. All right. Now I'm talking about stock ups. Can you see that okay now, Stefan? Uh, Russ, actually, what you need to do is rather than, rather than advancing the slides within PowerPoint on your machine, um, you need to advance them within the WebEx window. Here we go. 
Here, let me go ahead and do it right now. I'm on, uh, let's see. I'm not the presenter on the WebEx. Hmm. Okay, I'm you taking over right now. So, Russ, go ahead. I'm on uh, slide number three where it talks about doc jobs. Just, just go ahead and say next screen. I'll be more All happy right. to advance for you. Thank you. So the doc ops, uh, we moved our documentation from being downloaded PDF files to being web-based doc ops. It's a blog-based formatting. We call it a wiki-based formatting. It allows for public access to all sections of the manual except the programming guide. And it also allows for direct links from one section to another so that if you're in the messages guide and because you're looking up a message that you received and the message guide has a re reference back to one of the utilities, it will have a link in it. You click on that link. You don't just download the utilities manual. It goes right to that section in the utilities section and it gives you a direct link there. And there's also the ability to put in comments, ask for clarification, and if you put comments in, it comes directly back to our tech writing department who gets with level two and development right away to find out how to enhance the documentation to answer your questions better. We also made a minor doc change, but it's very important to security administrators out there to change all references from password to security profile. The old internal security profile is now called, is no longer called the password. It's only called the security profile. And a lot of auditors had problems when we used to call it password because they felt that all passwords need to be encrypted and all kinds of requirements. So we've changed it to a security profile. All right, next screen. Passphrase support. There is one place within CA1 where we ask for your user ID and password from the external security system. And that's when you run TMS init as a started task after the initial execution following an IPL. So you do an IPL, you run TMS init, not a problem. A couple days later, you run TMS init because you want to change some options. And if you run TMS init as a started task, you get an IEF TMS 32 asking for their user ID and an IEF TMS 22. These are, these are both going to be issued when SEC WTO is set to yes, which is strongly recommended, and TMS init is a started task. If the response to the, no change at all in those messages, they're still exactly the same. Where the change comes in is the reply to the IEF TMS 22 can be either a standard short password, one to eight characters in length, or a passphrase, 10 characters to 100 characters, I believe 100 characters is the maximum from the external security systems, RAC app, ACF2 top secret. So based on your reply, we'll either treat it as a password or a passphrase and call the external security system to validate it normally. Any next page, next screen. Any restrictions on the passphrase, such as it must contain two lowercase, two uppercase, and three numerics, will be based on your external security product. Nothing to do with CA1. And again, if the reply is less than nine characters, we will treat it as if it was a password. Remember that if you do enter a large passphrase from the council, from SDSF, it usually requires quotes 
especially when blanks and special characters are part of that passphrase. Next screen. A status display. We have had a very old re request from clients. I want to know if CA1 is active or not. I want my operator to know, to be able to tell if CA1 is active or not. And I don't want to have to log on to ISPF and go into the CA1 ISPF system to see if it's active or not. And since historically, as you all know, TMS init always ends while, when it executes, starts and ends, we don't have a started task that is required out there up and running all the time. There is a CTS address space, but it's optional and many clients don't use it. So we've added with release 14 a TMS status command. And the TMS status command is going to come back with a TMS 0200i message that is a multi-line message telling you if CA1 is active, inactive, batch active, or not yet fully initialized. Next screen. Here are some examples of issuing the TMS status command. I issued TMS status after Chi-RIM had run, but before I had run TMS init. So the subsystem has been defined because I have run Chi-RIM and all the LPA modules have been loaded, but I haven't actually run TMS init yet. In that case, I get back CA1 is not yet fully initialized, and tape tracking and protection is not active. Then TMS init runs, and I do the TMS status. This time I got back CA1.14.0 is batch active, because when TMS init had been run, I had replied with the password to have CA1 made batch active. Then I ran TMS init again and made CA1 fully active. And when I issued the TMS space status command, I get back CA1 14.0 is active, OSI is installed, tape tracking and protection is active. So this TMS space status is a simple command that can be issued through SDSF, SysView, the operator council. You could set up your OpsMVS system or whatever to issue the message. At this point, status is the only subcommand that TMS respects. If you have some other commands you would like to see, please go to the community site and issue a uh, create an idea to say, oh, I'd like TMS to be able to display, and I don't know what it is you want to display. Do you want to display volume records from the council? Do you want to display, I don't know, CA1 options, um, a status display that tells what percentage of the audit is for? I don't know. That's why we're leaving it very let you guys come up with some ideas as to what you would like to see displayed when you do a TMS command. Next screen. Some new options were also added. And these options were added based on ideas that came from the client base. The first one is RPGDG. RPGDG acts the same as RP, which is the, this is the default expiration retention period to give to a tape file that does not have any expiration date retention period specified in the JCL. The difference is that RPGDG only applies to GDGs, hence the name RPGDG. It's the same as RP, but it applies only to GDGs. If you don't specify it, 
because you were upgrading from 12.6 and it wasn't an option in 12.6, that's fine. It'll opt. The default is to do the same thing that RP does. Where you can use it is, for example, you might say RP is set to 005. I want to give a five-day retention as my default retention to any tape file created without JCL-defined EXPDT or retention period. But I want all of my GDGs by default to get catalog control. So I set RPGDG to catalog and RP to 005. It makes it for a very easy way to assign default retention based on the type of file being created. Now, of course, the RP value will be overridden if you have any RDS rules coded, but if you don't have an RDS record match or you don't have an RDS entry of DSN equals dash to as a catch-all, then the RP and the RPGDG will take effect. Next screen. Another new option we added, and it's actually two options, is called EXP SEC A for expiration security action and EXP SEC V value. This stems from a requirement or a request from a client that wanted to have the ability to use external security rules to control who could specify EXPDT equals 99365 in their JCL. And while I could understand wanting to control the creation of tapes with 99365 permanent control specified in the JCL, I felt that just as important as it is to control who wants to create a tape file that will be kept permanently, Keeping a tape for, oh, say, 100 years might not be permanent, but it's almost as good. So we went a step farther, and instead of just controlling EXPDT99365, we can also control who can create long retention files. So EXPSEC-A can be specified as none, born, or ABN. None, which is the default, means everything works as it does now. Don't do anything with regard to external security. Born and ABN will cause a security call to be performed to determine whether or not you have access to a unique resource. Next page. The unique resource name is EXPSEC. And it's in the class or group of CA tape. So the same place where you would have things like for res, for no res, BLP res, BLP no res defined. You could also define ESPSEC. Now, if EXPSEC A is set to either WARN or ABEND, in that case, we look at the value, the EXPSEC V value. And if the value is specified is a number of days into the future. So, for example, if EXPSEC A is set to WARN or ABN, and EXPSEC-V is set to 3,650, I'm going to make a security call whenever a file is created where the JCL specified EXPDT or retention period is more than 10 years into the future. No security call is made at all for L-day control, cycle control, or catalog control. Now, in the example I've got there, 
you can see that I put this into warning mode. So the IEF TMS 39 was issued as a W, not as an E for error. And after the 39W saying I'm not authorized to create the tape file with high retention or 99365, there is an informational message. The informational message simply tells me what had been specified in the JCL, which was 318 in the year 2026, and that it must be less than the calculated EXP sec V, the value, which was calculated as March 13, 2026. So I had created a file with a retention period of 3,655 because it was five days more than the 3,650 value I had specified. So this is something you could use if you wanted to allow your external security system to better control when people code high values in their EXPDT or retention period values to control when they control high retention tape files. If you set the value, the EXP sec V, to 9999959, then it will only be issued for permanent. But if you want to touch tapes that were created, say, anything more than 100 years into the future, you could set the EXP sec V value to 36,500 on let's say 25, because I think in the next 100 years there would be 25 leap years. So, next screen. Another major enhancement we made to 14.0 is in the TMO key XX member. TMO key XX is where you specify how you subdivide the 50-byte user area. Currently, you would specify a keyword, an offset, and a length. So if you wanted to subdivide the user bit, the user, the 50-byte user area into, say, a 20-byte programmer name followed by 10 characters of accounting data followed by a four-digit creation LPAR name, you could do that in the TMO key member. However, you would then have to use either the accounting exit, exit J, and or the uh, exit C to put the data into the record. We know that the clients would like us to, to not have as much of a requirement on assembler user exits, and so we wanted to give you a way of doing this, of using that 50 byte user area without having a requirement to code user exits. Next screen. So we've changed the TMO key member so that there are now optional from equals and from a list of predefined values. Now, if you use the from equals, the length, depending on which keyword was specified on the from, the length might be generated for you. And also, the offset becomes optional because the assumption will be that each field starts where the last field ended. So all of a sudden, the only required keywords in the TMO key member is the keyword equals, and if you want to use the from equals for one of our predefined values, we will go ahead and get the information automatically from one of those predefined values. Now, next screen, 
what are those predefined values? We're starting out with a dozen of the most useful fields we could possibly think of. And again, if there are more fields that you think should be added to this, the community's website would be the perfect place to put that request in. But the predefined fields that we will now gather data from automatically for you without requiring you to write a user exit are the accounting data and optional open parentheses, X close parentheses indicates a specific subfield within the accounting data. So if you wanted to save off the third subfield of the accounting data, that could be done. The programmer name, the creating SMS ID or the creating system name, if it's different from the SMS ID, some sites it is, or the creating sysplex name. Maybe you just care about which sysplex created the tape. So you could put any one or all three of those. Maybe you want to keep track of the actual job number that the job had been that had created this tape. Or the true SMS data class, storage class, or storage group. Remember, we already store the management class, but if you want to store the data class, storage class, and or storage group into the 50 byte user area, you could do that as well. The creating user ID, or maybe you want to keep the security group ID. You don't care about the individual user, you want to know which group the user belonged to or the PROC step name. If you execute PROCs that are multi-step PROCs and you want to keep track of which PROC step it was, that could also be done. So it's your choice as to which of these fields would get stored into the 50 by user area. Obviously, you can't select them all because 50 bytes you're not going to be able to put all of these into a 50 byte area, it just doesn't add up mathematically. But you, the individual user, can pick and choose which field you want without having to code a assembler user exit. An example is worth 50 words, so at this point, next screen, we'll go to an example. Here I've coded it up to say that the keyword name is programmer name, from programmer. I want to put a delimiter of PGM equals in front of it, and I only want to limit it to 10 characters in length. Then I want to get some accounting code from the accounting second subparameter starting at the third character. So I'm going to copy from the accounting parameter the second subfield within the accounting data, starting with the third character. And the delimiter that will appear before it is comma ACT equals. Obviously, the comma is to help separated from the programmer name. And the length will be eight characters. Then I will pick up the creating user. And again, the delimiter will be comma user equals. I want to limit it to a length of seven. It's optional, <coughs> but if I didn't specify anything, if I didn't specify anything, I would be showing the uh, eight characters because the uh, user ID by default length is eight. And finally, LPAR, the creating LPAR will be from the SMF ID. And you notice on the 
SMF ID, I didn't specify a length, so it will default to a length of four. Now, using this as my control statement, next screen, these are the results that are obtained. I ran a job with this as my TMS extend as my job card. I specified the 1, 2, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H as the second parameter of my job card. And you can see what I used as my um, Oh, excuse me, what I had put for my accounting data. Then below that, I'm going to show you what I had done for the user area. These are the 50 bytes of the user area that are now going to show up in that TMC web volume record created by that job. Starting in column one of the user data, I've got PGM equals and from the programmer name in my job card, I have my R-FIT. Then I have ACT equals ABCDEFGH. ACT equals ABCDEFGH because the ACT had been specified as the second accounting subparameter starting at the third byte. So it picked up the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Then I picked up my user ID, and WITRU02 is my user ID, with an LPAR of XE90. So I was able to select these four fields to be stored in the 50-byte user area, and I did that without having to code any assembler user exits. So it's an easy way to store user-specified data into the TMC user area on the volume record. Useful if you want to start keeping track of the creating, I don't know, Sysplex. Maybe you want some SMS storage groups to be stored in the user area. Uh, maybe you're interested in security group, accounting data. You've currently got an exit J. And that's perfectly fine if you want to continue using your existing exit J. But if you want to switch to this method and eliminate your user exit, this gives you that option. So this is giving you a way to... This is giving you a way to... Sorry. Got some feedback here in the room. Um, this gives you a way to control the 50 by user area without having to code an exit. Any questions? No? Next screen. And last, some on-demand replication. Now, it is on-demand replication, not a real-time replication of the TMC, and it allows you to use the CTS address space on one LPAR to send and receive a copy of the TMC to another system on another LPAR. There are a couple of new tasks that would be defined to the CTS start member used by the CTS address space. The R master, the replication master, subtask, and a communication. If for communication purposes, it's using CCI, um, which is the TCP IP interface from CA Common Services. Keeping a replicated copy at another site, if you are a site that have multiple active LPARs, this allows you to have a copy of each other's LPAR at the remote site. So what good would that replicated copy do you? You could use it for reporting purposes. 
maybe you have a situation where you want to be able to report on everything combined. So, um, so you could watch, you could run a TMS URL or a TMS GRW and concatenate both your TMC and the replicated TMC together. Another way you could use it is in Vantage, and I'll get into how you could use it from Vantage in just a minute. Next screen. To do this, what you would need to set up is you would need to set up where those other systems are that you want to replicate and you give it a name, you give it an LPAR, and you give it the name of the TMC that's used on that LPAR. Next screen. So if you're using the CTS address space, you'll have a DD statement within it for each of the replicated systems you're replicating to your system. So on Plex B, I might have a DD statement pointing to Plex A's copy and to Plex C's copy. They must be pre-allocated, and it's recommended, though not required, that they be the same DCB attributes. Another made, the next screen. There are some commands that can also be done such as a sync command and a status command. The sync command obviously will sync up the TMC to the other systems. And the status command will tell you what the status is. If I'm in the process of sending it, which system, or if when I've received the last replicated copy from the other system. When I send a copy of my TMC to the other system, I do it in a synchronous operation. So I send it to one other system at a time. Next screen. Here's an example of the status command. My status command was issued on Plex 90, and I can see from the status that I am active to LPAR DE34, I had a last successful sync where I had sent my TMC to DE34 at 16.33, and I had received a copy of their TMC on my system at 16.31. Next screen. <laughs> And a couple of minor enhancements we had done to release 14.0 was to assign a pseudo slot of 9999999. Seven nines, 9,999,999. Seven nines to all virtual volumes. And we're, we're identifying virtual volumes based on the robot type field. So if the robot type says it's an IBM virtual, or an SDK virtual, or a CAD tape virtual, and you are, slow, you are vaulting that volume, we will assign it the pseudo slot of 9999999. The EARL reports have been modified to have commented out lines that you can uncomment so that they're active that will look for this 9999999 value and bypass them for reporting purposes. Why would you want to do that? Obviously, it's very difficult to do a pick or a distribution of a virtual volume. I know 20 years ago it was fun to give a list of virtual volumes to the tape operator and ask them to go pick these tapes. but it kind of messes up the reporting purposes. So it makes it very easy to eliminate virtual volumes from being showing up on the picking or distribution lists. Whether you want them on the inventory list or not, that's up to you to decide. Next screen. 
We also made a minor, minor change to TMS pointers to support a DSM type equals large for the SysUT3 DD statement. If you're familiar with TMS pointers, and I hope you are, you know that the SysUT3 is where we make a copy, a point in time copy of the TMC that we then analyze. By supporting DSN type equals large for the SysUT3, we now allow you to run pointers against the TMC that exceeds 10 million total records. So if you have a very large TMC with a combination of volume and DSNB records that exceeds 10 million total records, you can now run TMS pointers against it. I don't think we had anybody in that case yet, but some clients are getting closer and closer to it. Next screen. Also some changes were done in Vantage. One of them, the main one that was done in Vantage, was to add to Vantage GMI, which is the no cost Vantage interface to CA1. So if you want a GUI interface to CA1, you can do that with this Vantage GMI. We give you the ability to take in a alternate TMC. That could be a backup TMC. It could be a TMC created by the replication feature from another site. Or it could even be your active TMC. Now, if you're using this method, to look at an alternate copy of the TMC, it uses a new utility called CTSXUtil, which is included with CA1 14.0. This gives you a faster way of reading the TMC and sorting the data into volume records and DSMB records. So that's why you might want to use this method to look at your active TMC. It'll load it faster than the current method will. Next screen. To get to these new objects, in the CA1 section, there are some new uh, icons added at the very bottom. Backup TMC volumes, backup TMC files. So these are new objects added to the CA1 tree. The fields themselves are identical to what you see in the volumes and files. It's just how we access the data. And this, the data is presented from an extract file created by the CTSX util, utility. And it's read-only access. So if you want to do updates, you have to go to the regular um, CA1 volumes or files. This is for read-only access. Next screen. If you selected those, the TMC uh, volumes, you're going to see a action of enter the backup TMC and you would enter the name of the backup TMC. In this case, I'm using one of the shadow TMCs created by the replication system. And then you check the check mark box to say run the disk TMC build to create the CTSUX util job. Once you've clicked on that and accepted it, it'll run this batch job that will create the objects. And it will give you the same objects that you see in the TMC, but it allows you to get it from another source. Where would you use this? Um, possibly you want to look at a backup TMC from a month ago. And then by using the join function within Vantage, you could join the CA1 active TMC with the backup TMC and look at all the files that have been changed, all the volume records that have been changed in the last month and which field was changed. Um, you want to be able to just look at the data. So you want to look at the data from a backup TMC, 
from a replicated TMC from another system, all while at the same time having a view of your active TMC. All right, and that concludes what was added in 14.0. I'm going to spend the next 10, 15 minutes looking at some of the features that were added in 12.6 that a lot of clients haven't been using and you should be because it's been available in 12.6. Next screen. Improved MVS catalog performance. Within the CTS address space, an optional subtask called SMFQ has been created. If it's present, when the SMF record is created by the catalog address space to indicate that a file, tape file, has been cataloged or uncataloged, instead of waiting to update the TMC, which delays the whole catalog operation, the transaction is simply put into a queue, and this SMFQ subtask will read the queue every five seconds and update the TMC appropriately. This prevents the TMC and audit from being updated in the catalog address space and improves the performance of the MVS catalog since the MVS catalog is not reserved while the TMC is being updated. So if you've got a large DB2 backup job that creates 5,000 tape files on a single volume, when the job goes through step termination, we have to update all 5,000 DSNBs to indicate those files have been cataloged. That takes a while, even with YSVC processing. Now what will happen is those 5,000 transactions will simply be added to the queue and the job will complete, so the job will complete much faster. So if you've got a large environment and you've noticed some catalog performance, you might want to think about simply turning on the SMFQ subtask. To turn this feature on, you simply start up the CTS address space on each LPAR that you want to turn this on and start the SMFQ subtask. And if you want to turn it off, you simply stop the SMFQ subtask. It's as easy as that. Next screen. Volume pool monitor. This was delivered as maintenance years ago in 12.6. It monitors activity for user-defined subpools not a CA1 subpool that you would use for subpooling tapes, but a defined subpool for monitoring purposes only. And we'll look at that pool real time, and if we see that the number of volume scratch tapes gets below a user-specified threshold, we will issue an alert. And the alert can be either a WTO or even an email that will be sent to you telling you that this pool is getting low on scratch tapes. So instead of waiting until 6 o'clock Sunday morning to discover that you're getting low on scratch tapes and have to come into the office to do a TMS extend, you could now find out about this much earlier by having the threshold set appropriately with an email the week before. So you could do the TMS extend to add more volumes at your convenience. Next screen. You can do this by creating volume pools and alerts, and you can say what the alert thresholds are. It will monitor the pools constantly. Notification, again, is via email or a WTO. Substitution variables, and I'll give an example of that, are available for the emails so that you can have a substitution that tells you which LPAR, which pool is getting low, how low is low. It also keeps some history records. 
There are also some variables from TMS Clean, Copy, and the vaulting system, so that you can also look for things from TMS Clean, Copy, or the vaulting system to trigger the event. Next screen. And the actual volume pool monitoring can look for pools and it looks for how many tapes are active, scratched, out of service, or volumes which have never been used. And we can look for either specific values, tell me when less than 100 scratch tapes are available, or as a percent, tell me when this pool has less than 10% scratch tapes. So if you don't want to have to change this Every time you redefine the pool, you can change it to a percentage instead of a specific value. And I said that TMS Clean, Copy, and Vaulting also have some records. They create variables such as the return code, current scratch tapes, date and time of the last run, whether or not how many audit records were backed up, how many tapes went off-site, this type of information. So you could create an alert based on any of that information. Now the alert, next screen, here is a sample of the email alert as it exists in the PDF library. It's going to send an email to, and it's got a symbolic value and the title contains a symbolic value. This alert was on this date and time. This was my alert value. The number of scratch tapes has dropped below. That's my alert value. And this email will be sent every six or eight or whatever the hours is. Using this as my input to the email system, the next screen, this is the actual email that gets sent. An email was sent to Joe Bob Cravey telling him that my class pool one is low on tapes. The alert was sent on January 7th. The number of scratch tapes has dropped below 500. And this email will be resent every one hour until the shortage is corrected. Next screen. So this email can also be sent to a text device as a text message. Um, you know, you could send it to your telephone number at text.att.net or verizontext.com or whoever. You know, everybody's got their own way of receiving text messages. So if you don't have an iPhone, uh, Android device that's capable of receiving emails, on your Android device you can receive a text message. So you can be alerted whenever you're getting low on scratch tapes. Next screen. Another enhancement that was delivered in 12.6 was some improved validation if you're using an IBM tape library. For those of you using an IBM tape library, you're very familiar with the CTS Sync utility. We added a new parameter called Sync Test. Sync Test doesn't actually perform any updates and it validates all three databases. It compares the TMC against both the OAM, which is all sometimes called the TCDB or Volcat database, and the library manager database inside the robot itself. And if they're out of sync between the two IBM robots, or between either of the IBM databases and the TMC, you'll get an error message. Here's an example of an out of sync between the Volcat and the library manager. One says it's scratched, the other one says it's unprotected. So this is a way of getting your out of sync conditions between the IBM databases as well as if either IBM database is out of sync with CA1. Next screen. 
We also delivered an enhancement to keep track of an improved method for keeping track of the number of bytes actually written to tape. If the tape is being written with either variable block or undefined block size, you don't really know how much data was written to the tape. Block count times block size really is insufficient. So we're keeping a new one byte field that actually allows us to determine block count times block size times this X percentage tells me how much data was actually written to the tape. We have a new URL that will report from this as well as Vantage will use this so that the Vantage GMI when reporting the number of gigabytes is reflecting the actual true number of gigabytes written to each tape. That's done at both the volume level and the file level. Next screen. IBM added the ability for the label anomaly exit to specify the next volume if it's missing. If you're reading a tape volume for input and it reaches end of volume, EOV, before it reaches end of file, EOF, then ZOS will allow the label anomaly exit to automatically substitute the correct next vol seer. At this point, you would see an IBM message, the IC710I, saying another volume is expected and we will substitute that the real next volume from the next vault field in the TMC record for the volume currently mounted. That means that in your JCL, if you're reading a multi-volume not cataloged file, you only have to specify the first volume in the JCL. You don't have to list all of the volumes in the correct order. All you have to do is specify the first volume and we will take care of through substitution all of the secondary volumes. It makes it much easier to read a multi-volume file that spans multiple volumes. That's not cataloged. And last, just to spend a few minutes on the community's website. I wanted to emphasize again how much, next screen, how much we're using the community's website. I want to skip ahead a couple screens here. One more. Here it is from the CA1 storage, uh, mainframe storage. From the mainframe storage, you can select a category. You'll notice on the top left-hand box, CA1 is at the top. You can also limit it to only look for um, certain types of records, maybe ideas versus questions and uh, polls and documentation updates. If you see an idea, please think about responding to it. Next screen. Or if you have your own idea, please think about putting your own idea in. Very easy to add an idea by simply uh, creating your idea and putting the information in. Here's an existing idea and you can either vote it up or down or add a comment. So maybe you see an idea from a client to do X. Well, you already do that by simply running this job. Put that in as your comment and let the client know, the other client know, that he could do what he wants to do simply by running this other job. Next screen. Or you could add your own by simply creating a title, putting your idea in, and telling us which product or products it's applicable to. Last screen. And finally, videos. We are coming out, soon we'll be coming out, don't know exactly how long it will take legal to authorize it, but we're planning to come out with some how-to videos on the CA channel. CA Technologies has their own channel on YouTube. 
and we're going to come out with some how-to videos with regard to CA1. The first video will be how to plan for TMS Extend, and the second video will be how to execute TMS Extend. Once those videos are out, we'd always be interested in hearing from you, the client, through the community's website, any other how-to videos you'd like to see produced. And with that, I am done exactly at the top of the hour. <laughs> nice, nice job, Russ. Yeah, I, folks, I want to uh, reemphasize something that Russ was talking about. Um, when he was saying, you know, we want your ideas here within the storage communities, I too need your ideas in terms of what you would like to learn more about storage management. Certainly new releases are great, you know, what are the new enhancements, et cetera, but um, Russ was mentioning how-to videos. What, would, what else, what other products? Is it Vantage? Is it TLMS? Is it VTape, DISC? I need you guys to give me some ideas of, of some videos or webcast topics that you would like. Um, what you're also going to see uh, the, the remainder of this year is um, more what we call office hours or technical chats uh, within the communities as well. So we're going to try that at least once a month. We'll be more uh, be happy to uh, you know uh, promote that here within the communities send out emails to you as well. So we need your ideas. Please don't be shy. Uh, let us know what interests you and how we can be of uh, better service to you. Um, I think we have one question out there. Uh, Len, I'm going to defer to you. If you could, I can't yeah. see the questions, but if you could read that, please. Yeah, you know, there were actually a couple questions that came in via the chat that came just to me, so I'll go ahead and read those. <clears throat> Uh, the first one is, we currently run the CTS started task on one LPAR per Plex. If we want to take advantage of the SMFQ subtask, will it require the CTS subtask to run on all LPARs with the Plex? Yes, the, answer, the, the, the short answer is yes. However, you will want to make sure that some of the subtasks, such as TMS APEC, are only run on one LPAR. So the CTS start member might have to be different so that only the SMFQ subtask is activated on the CTS for LPAR 2, 3, and 4. APEC is only run on LPAR 1, as an example. But the short answer is yes. You would need to have the CTS address space with the SMFQ subtask active on all LPARs. It can be implemented one LPAR at a time. So if you put it on one LPAR first and you monitor that system to see what kind of a performance enhancement it gives you and then roll it out to the others, that's fine. All right, great. Thanks, Russ. And uh, there's an, another question in the chat. This might be related, but I don't have the technical knowledge to know that, so I'll just go ahead and read the whole thing. Um, we have Sysplex where we use the same TMC on all LPARs. In this presentation, you seem to suggest a different TMC for every LPAR. What is the best way? We currently have Zara on all LPARs and CA1 on one LPAR with plans to put CA1 on all LPARs. Yes, you would have CA1 on all LPARs. No, in a Sysplex environment, most sites with a Sysplex environment will run with a common TMC shared by all of the LPARs. If you've got multiple plexes and with the on-demand replication feature, we're talking about having maybe a data center in Kansas and a second data center in Columbus, each with their own TMC, but they want to make a copy of each other's TMC at the other guy's location. If you've got a multiplex environment, there it's a mix. Some clients will have a single TMC shared by multiple sysplexes. Others will do it on a sysplex by sysplex, each having their own TMC. It depends more on the tape usage. If the tapes are shared between the sysplexes, 
you probably want to have a single TMC. If Cisplex 1 never reads Cisplex 2's tapes and Cisplex 2 never reads Cisplex 1 tapes, you probably want to have unique TMCs. It really depends on your environment and tape usage. All right, thanks, Russ. And then the, the last question, this actually came in about 20 minutes ago. Um, it says, can you call those fields from a TMS GRW? So it, it's obviously this responding to something. Yeah, that's ahead, talking Russ. about the new. That's talking about the new keywords in the TMO key member. And yes, those are reportable through GRW. And if you report on them through GRW, you do not get the delimiter. If you remember, you would have things like a delimiter saying C LPAR equals, and then the LPAR name. If you run a GRW report, you wouldn't see that C LPAR. You would only see the four character LPAR name reported for that keyword. All right, uh, that, thanks, thanks again, Russ. That, that I believe is the, the last question in the system. I don't see anything in the chat or in the Q&A, so I will thank you okay. and thank Stefan as well. Stefan, you want to wrap up or are we good? Yeah, I just want to let everybody know that we are going to get you a copy of today's presentation along with the replay link. Uh, there was a lot of information that was uh, shared today. We want to make sure that you get all of the information. So we'll be sending all that to you as well. Uh, if you have any follow-on questions, again, uh, use the CA communities uh, to pose a question. Please reference uh, the webcast that Russ did today so that we can put it in context. And with that, um, I want to thank everybody for their time. And Russ, thank you especially. Uh, this was a lot of good information. Congratulations on a great uh, release.